Thank you for your nice introduction. Uh, so to inform Aditi was one of my student. Uh, I was teaching her criminology when she was doing for, for masters in forensic. So I'm happy that uh, I can see my student has evolved as HOD of a department. Thank you. So I sincerely take this opportunity to thank the organizers, especially the principal Vilas Chavan for inviting me and Dr. Ranjit Singh for uh, uh, recommending me for this program and uh, I'm glad to see a lot of young minds here and uh, these are the people who are going to take uh, the digital forensics and cyber criminology to the next level uh, because we are now in a different era. This era is marked for digital natives like you people and we are all digital immigrants. We only have come after internet uh, uh, was arrived, you are all there but we were only learning now. So you have a big task ahead and uh, under the leadership of uh, your uh, uh, teachers, uh, you will be evolving in a better places than uh, we were placed earlier. And uh, today I have a specific uh, task to give an orientation on the key theme uh, that is the new age forensics, especially on uh, digital forensics. So uh, can I see the first slide? So when you see the spaces, earlier there were only three spaces, land, air, and water. And then the outer space, of course, is there. But the new space which has come is the cyberspace. And that happened uh, through a novel by Gibson uh, in a novel called Neuromancer. But uh, somewhere in 1980s, as a kind of a imagination or a fiction where he mentioned there is a space in between the telecommunication networks and that way uh, you will see a space which is unreal, but now it has become a rea reality over the past several years of time. In the past 40 years, there is a space which is called as a cyberspace. And a lot of potential. So that is the key thing uh, in uh, cyberspace compared to the physical space. In physical space, limitations are many in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of caste, in terms of uh, religion, in terms of region, everything. But cyberspace opens up a space where equality, freedom is guaranteed. And that is a space that which is uh, going to be the next space which will bring people together but also comes with some kind of a deficit. While cyberspace increases the people's connectivity, it reduces the connectivity between people who are very near to us. So we are able to connect with four people, but we are not able to connect with our own people. So nowadays in each house, everybody has a cell phone. You can find that uh, father is having, mother is having, children are having. And everybody is speaking with somebody other than their parents, their children. And that makes them a little bit uh, uh, outside the framework. And they are no more closer than the previous times. And that is a little bit danger, of course. So that has its positivity and negativity. And also the key element of anonymity. Anonymity is something that which we want, which gives us privacy because we do not want to expose everything to others. And that cyberspace gives that. But that's the anonymity also creates a space where you will see that offenders utilize that and misuse that. And new forms of crime have emerged over the period of 20 years which was not there earlier. And then some people group it with conventional uh, things, uh, like uh, uh, crime with cyber crimes, which we will discuss later. So I would uh, request for the next slide. So before going into the key uh, program, uh, key study, uh, I am always interested in the history, and history is very fascinating. Uh, and history doesn't mean only the history of Rajas and others. Everything has a history. So today, when you are organizing this first uh, national conference. It is a history after some days that uh, you will remember that uh, this institution has uh, come with a new idea which uh, is very uh, new in this area. And you see that the internet growth potential is greater, the next slide please, uh, that it came somewhere 40-50 uh, years back by the Americans and especially these were between only the defense people and uh, the transfer happened between some net called ARPANET. But later, uh, professors were utilizing it uh, from Harvard University and other Pennsylvania University to transfer uh, themselves some emails. 
and slowly slowly the development happened that uh, it came to public so when sir teams barnes lee of the uk he discovered something called as invented something called as www which is world wide web when world wide web came into picture then the access came to the public then after that you will see that earlier times coding and other thing make the screen very black that uh, we have to give some instructions but now the technology have gone with the graphical user interface that people started using it and now the technology has become a normality that means that everybody ha knows how to use so earlier times you'll see that there's needs of a knowledge for example using a microsoft uh, um, 95 or something older versions you need certain knowledge uh, now you can use ms office without any big knowledge the same goes with the internet on the others the next slide please and the biggest thing that arrived in 2000 after all you people are born is the social media. So what makes social media so different is that it is the tool in the hands of the people. Earlier media means it is governed by certain group of people sitting at the top, right? So electronic media is something that which is given to you in the hands. Whereas the media earlier time is a print media or any visual media is by rich people, is by upper class, is by others, which is not accessible to others. And also, whatever knowledge they are giving is what the knowledge we need to consume. So if somebody is writing in Hindu, we have to read and then we think that is correct or somebody is writing in Times of India or Indian Express or any NDTV or others. But then, 2004, a person named Mark Zuckerberg came into picture and he brought in something called Facebook. And Facebook is not new where uh, the earlier times Orkut uh, social media software was there uh, and people were using that. But not that powerful, but uh, Facebook may become more and more powerful because it gives the power to the hands of normal people. So there was a change in the media. The media is that people owned media and the content. But in social media, they only want the media, but not the content. So in Facebook, what we are doing, we are the content provider. We are providing content, whereas Mark Zuckerberg is providing only a platform. That means this hall is provided by the university or the institute, but the content is provided by me. Now I am presenting to you. That is what Facebook is. Same thing that every millions of individuals now come into Facebook and make uh, their comments, their everything. So slowly you will see that the thing mood and mood and Google came into picture in 98 itself but then Google was not for social media it was a search engine but later it acquired many other uh, platforms like YouTube and others and you will see that uh, these are very important moments in the online spaces uh, if you see the history and uh, what makes uh, different from the previous era previous era people before 2000 did not have the opportunity like what you are having at the present moment. So what they missed is that they missed the knowledge which they can give it to the world. So they had everything, but they didn't have a platform. So somebody wanted to dance, somebody wanted to paint, somebody wanted to write an article. They had the potential, but they don't have a platform. But you got the potential and also the platform where nobody can stop a person to do certain things. Earlier, people will stop you on many accounts. So. Uh, I would see that this is a revolution and uh, this revolution I would even uh, equate uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, people like Sergey Green, uh, Larry Page who founded Google uh, to the great uh, Ambedkar or Peria or other equal people who spoke on feminism and equality and freedom. So such a thing have arrived within the uh, space which we are enjoying now. Next. So the internet users have bloomed like anything in the data which you can see in January 2023 that uh, the world population is 8 billion and whereas the uh, active internet users is at least 5 billion and that is a very big amount of people and you can see that 4.76 billion population are into social media. So and mobile phone users are 5.44 so that is equal the same amount and you can see this di difference is also very large during this period compared to the 
20, 20 years back. So 20 years back, even if there is a uh, cell phone, that is not a smart cell phone, but that is a cell phone which you, we can only call people, but that was very costly also at the time. Now the cost has become very uh, less. You will see that the more number of people are using, the cost is very less. It's a very simple mathematics. So in the US, less number of people are there compared to the Indian population. That means the internet cost is very high in the U US and other places. Whereas India, it's very cheaper. So you see after Jio has announced free internet and you are all getting at least 2 GB per day uh, free also. And uh, even if it is not free, it is very small amount of money. So that makes us a large user of internet compared to the many other countries. But what for you are, we are using, what for others are using, that matters a big thing. Next. And you can see, you can see that uh, the internet users go on with various things, like uh, the percentage of the population is 64%, and average time spent is 6 hours. Uh, so the, the overall average is 5.5 hours, anybody is using internet. So the morning you are waking up, you are waking up with the internet. And the sleeping, you are going to sleep with the internet. So that means what? The internet is continuously governing your life. The internet is going to determine your decisions. Anything you want to know, that immediately you Google, or now you go to chat GPT and ask, what is this? So it's becoming very, very simple thing. The knowledge is there. But the problem here is that internet is a vast ocean. So we should know what to take from internet. That is very, very important. Uh, even though the users are there, but how the users are using that we can see in the next slide. Next. And you can see that uh, the internet adoption, at least an average of uh, certain countries, you will see worldwide, 64.4 adoption is there. But the more countries are, of course, in the Western uh, nations, uh, but uh, India is also coming into the average picture. Next. And the adoption you can see in this map, where uh, the USA has a large number of adoption, 6.7%, and then uh, there are other people who are using 6.8% in Southern America. Of course, uh, Indian region, Southern Asia, is combinedly 18.5% is very high. That means the, all the South Asian nations, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and uh, Afghanistan and uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Bhutan, Nepal also. So that makes a little bit uh, uh, very stronger. But again, the nations are not po that powerful compared to the nations which are like USA or Singapore. Next. Uh, this is the older data, of course. You can see that uh, the internet speed was somewhere in 2014. The maximum speed was 60 MBBS. Can anyone say the current uh, MBBS you are using in this institution? How many Mbps? 200 Mbps. Okay, so minimum 200 Mbps somebody is using. Uh, I, um, I'm using a uh, service which is 300 Mbps, but I'm seeing that there are even higher uh, Mbps, like 400 and 500. So what makes uh, speed important? The speed is important because of the data retrieval. So earlier, uh, when I was doing research somewhere in uh, 90s, uh, we have to wait one hour to get certain data. So it takes a longer, longer time for a page to refresh even. So we have to wait, patiently wait. But now within two, three seconds, even a full movie of 2 GB is getting downloaded. And that gives us a bigger power. So more speed, more power. Next. And uh, you can see in this slide that how uh, the daily time spent using the internet is there, where uh, the worldwide average is uh, 6, but Indians are using 5.5 at least uh, for uh, the sake of internet. Uh, the next one. And mostly what we are using. So the top is chat and messaging. So chat and messaging becomes a very, very key thing that you connect with people. So what, what is the difference that internet is providing? Because you can speak with anyone, right? You can chat with anyone, probably the people whom you have never met, you have never seen in your life also. So chat and messaging is stopping in this list. And this uh, is very important because this has killed many of the previous uh, technology like telegrams, like uh, even postal cards, like uh, letters now have gone. So people don't write love letters to others. Uh, that has gone. <laughs> so people only chat. So the technology has shrinked certain kind of a things and we have gone into just uh, chatting with people, messaging people. And more social networking is happening. So, so what's the advantage of social not networking online is that we people are three types. Introverts, extroverts and ambiverts. So 
introverts are very uh, difficult people in the real space they are not able to open up with others but in the online social networking it is very easy that any introvert will open up to anyone so that makes a bigger advantage for a sect of people who are disadvantaged and people who may have a complex that they are short they are not good looking they are fat or anything that the society may impose a negative standard on them they will find a solace in the internet to speak with anyone because internet nobody knows who you are what you are what is your height what is your weight how good are you looking or how knowledgeable you are but still it provides some space and that's why social networking is stopping in this and of course uh, mapping and other location based services and you see education is very less that is only 23.8 percent people are doing and next coming the food takeaway and delivery of course uh, zometo and delivery uh, as wiggy have come in a big way now uh, people are ordering food they are not cooking anymore in some spaces and that also gives little bit freedom but also creates some other issues uh, you can see that next what happens in uh, one internet minute and a lot of things are happening so a lot of downloads a lot of uploads uh, wikipedia articles everything is happening and uh, photo uploads are happening people are uploading photos and uh, things like that uh, but we are concerned as a criminologist or a forensic scientist our concern is that how much crimes are happening within one minute and what's happening so how much uh, uh, <laughs> hacking is happening how much botnet botnets are being sent and uh, how much uh, problem related to victims are happening and you can see the data that 20 victims at least are there in one minute but uh, it becomes a very big data which of course this i won't say it's a new data but still uh, i would say 50 people at least are getting victimized in one minute next so the next uh, phase of my lecture would be on cyber crimes from machines to humans so what way it is going from machines to humans is that when the internet started or the connectivity started it is between two machines by two people but now it is millions of computers and millions of people so that's why the transformation have happened next so the post world war scenario in 1940s uh, the inventions of uh, tele tele telephonic networks happened but the cyber crime was not properly defined that it is again a crime against machine or uh, something that connects with the uh, computer or computer assisted crimes next so the definitions changed over a period of time until 2000 you'll find that only the definition connects with technology and the knowledge to use technology and how people were attacking the machines so these were some of the definitions you can see that so always the definition shows that the cyber crime carries a connotation of any crime done with cyber <laughs> assistance only so without the cyber assistant if a crime is happening that is a normal crime but the crime which is happening with the cyber assistance becomes cyber crime next but 2001 there is a big transition happened where you will find that uh, the uh, convention uh, it, it mentioned a different one where the Budapest convention it, it's called as uh, cyber crime convention uh, something on emotions so people are can be attacked online by using impo improper words so that affects people who are marginalized genderized uh, and others especially when some bad words are used or some abusive language is used and that will hurt the emotion if something is hurting on the emotion what is the problem it's only happening online it is not the fact because whatever happens online also has a physical impact on us the same thing that like how we visualize a movie when we go to a theater and see a movie a kind of emotional movie between a mother and a son or a mother and daughter then we also cry at times right because it affects us the same case goes with online also that whatever we do in the social media and other places that somebody is attacking us online also has an impact on us and take an emotional toll on that and that uh, gave a kind of a full stop for cyber crime that everything means hacking it's not everything is hacking that even people can be attacked by online next so you can see that from machine to machine the direct human to real human attacks happen where only earlier times the machine was attacked by certain people and these people are called very knowledgeable nerds technology technocrats but the people now who we are attacked by are not that knowledgeable or 
ordinary people very simple people with one they are users only they know only how to use the internet but they are the people they are attacking us and that becomes a big problem for people who wants to come into cyberspace which is the space of equality next so we developed a definition in 2011 where we found, we have addressed this definition of cyber crime from a victimological perspective inclu including certain components where the offenses that are committed against individuals or groups of individuals with a criminal motive to intentionally harm the reputation of the victim or cause physical or mental harm to the victim directly or indirectly using modern telecommunication networks such as internet and uh, chat and mobile phones Uh, but slowly, I, uh, I hope now uh, this definition is nearly uh, uh, 10 to 12 years old. But uh, new components have can be added, like a new uh, technology like machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence is growing in a big way. So the definition needs to be expanded in this. So when it comes to cyber crimes against individuals, we make it two: that crime against persons and crime against property. The same goes with the real time also. There are cyber uh, crimes against property and crimes against uh, individuals. Next, in terms of interpersonal cyber crime, so we are now grouping into a um, group where the dissemination of viruses, botnets, and others, hacking, cracking, and then cyber harassment is now having a multi-dimension. That not only bullying but also stalking. stalking has become a crime after the nirbhaya incident in india and now the new laws like uh, bharatiya <coughs> shiksha uh, also is now defining what is mean by uh, stalking and others uh, the definition has uh, broadened now where uh, people are pursued and they are attacked and then uh, with a illicit motive so that makes it stalking bullying is something that which normally in our society is happening that we abuse people throw some banter on them but that becomes serious then it becomes a cyber bullying especially when somebody attacks us online by stranging and then uh, cyber hate online you will find lot of hate messages by by some people against muslims hindus or others based on their caste religion based on any any other thing and gender also cyber grooming is happening for sexual purposes that is uh, not only for uh, children and uh, women but also men are also gro groomed nowadays and the money is extracted in this way and child pornography is a big offense in the western nations of course in india also but india comparatively is uh, very less uh, in this particular crime and crimes in virtual environments Pe people recently would have read online that a girl was uh, raped in a virtual environment and there is no law in the uk to control that not only in the uk in other places also still a uh, lot of debates are going that whether crimes in virtual environments like second life and others like metaverse uh, should be banned so should be uh, criminalized so that is of discussion next is property crime where you will find that identity related crime so identity related crime is that somebody will steal our identity and get a loan from the bank see just imagine that you go you got a phone from the uh, manager manager is telling sir you have to pay your uh, interest for this month then you will wonder sir i have not taken a loan from you no uh, your name is ramesh uh, you have got a loan last month only 10 lakh rupees so please pay it so this type of problems is very futuristic but it is happening uh, in some places and people are not uh, telling it openly because uh, these uh, people get a little bit shame for this that identity related fraud and theft is happening online scams of course a uh, lot of scams are happening and romance scams is happening uh, recently uh, one bbc studio uh, video is available uh, in uh, amazon you can watch wedding.com Uh, so wedding.com uh, is providing i i was uh, giving a research support for that particular uh, series uh, wedding.com is to showing Hello. how Hello. women are lured into the matrimonial sites and how they are extracted money so a lot of women uh, especially women who are widowed who are divorced or a victim of lakhs and lakhs of rupees so that is a big thing uh, you can see that how this is happening on phishing you know that uh, some false website will come and take our information uh, that is there and content theft is also there uh, some are grouped as victimless crime because the victim himself or herself contribute to the uh, crime especially sexting uh, revenge porn uh, sextortion so sexting you know sending our for body parts uh, to people knowingly or uh, unknowingly to others uh, that is a sexting combination of sex and texting and the sextortion is something that happens after somebody owns our images and they will try to extract money if you don't uh, give the money we will uh, share the uh, picture to others 
And uh, of course, online gambling is a big thing now. Many of the states are trying to uh, stop this online gambling. Uh, but still, problem is there. Some people are committing suicide because they are losing money also. Next. So, in this regard, I find that the, in 2007, um, the cyber security and cyber forensics developed a little bit. But I find that uh, there is no study to uh, understand cyber crimes from a social science perspective. Next. So, I developed a new discipline, which I'll come to. So, you can see that cyber crime, uh, people are not grouping into a new crime. So, it is not a new crime because some people are thinking it's old wine in new bottles, old wine in bottles of varying shape, new wine in no bottles. Uh, next. But I always believe that cyber crime is unique. Why it is unique? Because it is not like the conventional crime. Cyber crime is so unique because it is transnational with no boundaries and no coordinates or latitude or longitude. So in a real time crime, we can fix a lat long. Suppose a crime is happening in this hall, we can fix the latitude, longitude and locate it and identify it. But whereas when a crime is happening online, we will not know which place it is coming from because even the IP address can be spoofed. So nobody can understand where the crime happened, where, which place and which time also. And it is an automated crime where they, several persons can be attacked, like a machine gun uh, spilling 50, 60 bullets at a time. So it can also attack many people, which is normally not possible in real space. And uh, earlier, it requires knowledge, but now it requires only the values, which are ideas and not physical property. So you see, uh, you are all digital forensic students, you know, zero, one, and one only, everything is there in the binary form. Right? So, when you have money in the bank, you may have 1 crore rupees, but everything is in binary only. But only when you put your ATM card, then take the money, it becomes real money in your hand that you have a paper money with you. Otherwise, every money is only uh, binary only. So, what has become a kind of a value, now only you can retrieve as a physical property after certain uh, techniques you can use uh, offline. So, cyber criminology is a discipline which I found in uh, 2007 and uh, I made it a definition, the study of causation of crimes online and its impact in the physical uh, space. So, that is the definition and uh, I launched a journal also to propagate this particular discipline and it is now more than 15 years of existence. Next. And it's a combination of many disciplines. Cyber criminology is not one discipline that it will, it will have a combination of criminology, victimology, sociology, uh, and uh, of course, uh, internet sciences also is a part of that. So, two reasons. One, uh, it should not be merged with cyber forensics and also cyber security. These are the two reasons that which I have bought. And now, cyber criminology is a discipline which is offered in many of the American universities in the syllabus, and it is growing now. And uh, I wish uh, Aditya College also will take up a course on cyber criminology. So that can be appended with your existing cyber science programs. Next. So I developed a theory also, and this theory is called space transition theory. Uh, probably people can go to the internet and check with it, uh, where uh, the idea is very simple. When you move from one space to another, you are not the same person. That is the simple idea. So you can connect with any idea. Like suppose you are sitting here as a person, you are a different person, but when you go to your house, you are a different person. The same idea is the same, where you can be a different person when you are online and you are not the same person. So, uh, there be, you can do the confirming and non-confirming also. Next. So, they have seven postulates, but I'm not uh, going to explain everything in detail of want of time. I'll be going to the crux. Uh, so, first postulate, persons with repressed criminal behavior have a propensity to commit crime in cyberspace, which otherwise they would not commit in physical due to their status and position. So people may have a repressed criminal behavior because every one of us uh, are violators of some rules and norms. So you see, in your childhood, always we tend to violate norms and uh, rules of the parents. But our parents controlled us, shaped us, so that we are now a confirming person. If they allowed us, we would have become an offender so, or a criminal. So that's the very nature, because human nature is to violate norms and rules. So we do not want to be arrested. We do not want to be uh, under the control of somebody or some rules. So that way, cyberspace gives us an opportunity to unleash our hidden uh, behavior. Next. So this work is cited more than 200 times now. And it is considered as a popular theory, but it has to grow a long way. Uh, I am waiting for that. So maybe in another 20 years, this will become a popular theory. 
Next. So in terms of uh, theory, I always think that it should become practical. So how it becomes practical, uh, I started an uh, online counseling center called as Center for Cyber Victim Counseling in 2009. It is available, uh, you can visit cybervictims.org. And we have counseled more than 5,000 people in the past 10 to 12 years uh, who were victims of uh, cyber crime. So that is one of our great achievement. And uh, any person who are uh, victims of cyber crime can come to our website, uh, log in, uh, just submit your query it will anonymously, and they will get response. And they will get psychological support, they will get uh, police support, they will get also technological support. So another one more theory that happened is irrational coping theory. So whenever any person becomes a victim of cybercrime, they retaliate in a wrong way. So they also try to hack the uh, email of others. They also try to attack the people on that. So victim turned offender is happening and that is one of the dangers of the internet that innocent people like us one day may become offender because we want to take revenge against some people and that will make us an offender. That is the irrational coping theory. Next. So cyber victimology is one area. Later, I came in 2015. Uh, I made it uh, as a presentation in the Perth conference, uh, World Society Victimology Conference. Next. So cyber victimology is the study of forms of online victimization, its impact on victims, responses, society, and systems. That's the thing. So it's also a growing discipline. Cyber victimology is also another growing discipline apart from uh, cyber criminology. Okay. So we will come to the crux of this particular conference, that is the New Age Forensics. So why I started with the cyber crime and then come, came to forensics is that, because forensics comes after the crime is committed, okay? So what and all the crimes are committed online or offline, then the forensic scientist comes into picture once everything is done. So that way, as a forensic scientist, you should know what crime is all about why crime is happening, where crime is happening. So that question, if you are addressing first, then you will be easy, easily managing the next question, how and when it happened. So in terms of the background, you'll find that uh, digital era has brought a lot of opportunities for us. And one of the key thing is the growth of digital forensics, a discipline which discusses on the collecting, analyzing, and preserving evidence for legal proceedings. You can get the uh, key terms in this particular definition, Collecting, analyzing, and preserving evidence. So evidence is a key part of forensic science. And that evidence is allowed in the Indian uh, Evidence Act, Section 45, now the new law, uh, the NIEM, also the 45, which gives expert opinion. So you can submit the evidence to the courts, and that is the legal proceeding. So as a digital forensic scientist, you are a combination of three subjects. You are a combination of science, you are a combination of law, and you are a combination of the technology. So you should always think from a multidisciplinary perspective. If you think only from a science perspective, you may fail because the law is not a science. Law is more a social science, works more with logic. Next. So you can see that uh, the growth happened. Forensic science has grown in the past uh, uh, more than 200 years, uh, but it has grown from uh, ordinary fingerprinting level and now to DNA fingerprinting. So more technology have been adopted in the past years. And you can see that uh, it is interconnected through digital means. Now, more technology have come, but uh, how to utilize it? That is, uh, matters a lot, uh, like uh, the use of, uh, usage of polygraph or usage of DNA fingerprinting. All these are technology-based nowadays. But the more usage have happened because of the digital means that you are going to use uh, technology, which are earlier alien to people. Next. So where the source is happening? The source is the wealth of information is available within the uh, technology. That means the usage of cell phone, the computers and others, those becomes your uh, place for culling out data. So data becomes key. Earlier data was used, but data now has become the vast space for everything. And uh, digital forensic is focusing on retrieving, analyzing and preserving electronic evidence. Next. So, in terms of understanding uh, digital forensics, you should know that it is not only for criminal cases, but also for civil cases, it can be utilized. And that way, it can use many aspects, not only one aspect that is connecting with mobile phone, with everything. So that there are some separate sub-disciplines of uh, the digital forensics, which you are going to uh, discuss in the coming two days. Next. 
So one is computer forensics. Of course, computer forensics, the word itself is very clear that uh, anything within the computer systems becomes the forensics, especially when you want to uh, recover deleted uh, data or the analysis of system logs when people logged into it and examination of the internet browsing history. And even though uh, Google gives an opportunity for incognito, still uh, that can be recovered by other technology and other means. And mobile device forensics is another thing that using the mobile phones. So next. Network forensics, I think people are aware of that. So the, in the networks, how you can cull out data. And then the last one is the cloud forensics. I think uh, the four uh, themes of this particular conference also connects with computer forensics, mobile forensics, and then network, and also uh, cloud forensics. Uh, next. So in terms of uh, cybercrime investigation, digital forensics plays a very, very important role. And not only cybercrimes, but also uh, fraud, child exploitation, traditional offenses also can be uh, uh, investigated using digital forensics. Next. Uh, the cybercrime investigation, of course, that I, I made an intro on that. Uh, you can see that a lot of activities are happening online, and that makes digital forensics indispensable. And uh, investigators must uh, trace the digital footprint. So this is very important. Uh, in real life, we are making footprint that is erased. So when you are walking on a sand, it is gone. Uh, but in uh, reality, uh, in uh, cyberspace, every one second we are making a digital footprint. It is available always there, anywhere we can retrieve. Next. Child exploitation cases is one cases. So next. Counter-terrorism efforts. See, internet is used by in, uh, the terrorist for two reasons. One is that they want to uh, call out people to join their organization. Other is that they want to send messages to each other. So these are all part of the digital forensics that you can work on. Next. Of course, traditional uh, f um, cases where uh, some murder have happened. So the murderer's cell phone is in your hand. So you can call out certain data, like when the geolocation data happened, what are the call records, what are the text messages, all these things you can do. Next. So a lot of challenges are evolving in digital forensics because of the growth of digital forensics for the past 20 years. You'll see that many new things have evolved. So a lot of uh, challenges are going to happen next. So encryption and privacy concern. Uh, recently, I think you saw that WhatsApp is coming with the end-to-end -end encryption. Everybody's talking about encryption and privacy. So this will create a problem because certain data will be stored in certain places only, in servers in California and others, but not in other places. Of course, uh, there will be data. It's not Data is not totally encrypted that I won't agree that uh, because in internet, privacy is not there. People say privacy is there, but it is not there. So still, we need to connect with that uh, giants, that is internet giants or others, to get some data from them. Next. So rapid technological advances. So within these 20 years itself, a lot of uh, new softwares have come. And uh, when you go to the workforce in another 20 years, again new technology will come, and the, all the old technology will become obsolete. So that means a digital forensic scientist like you should be continuously updating yourself. If you don't continuously update yourself, then you'll be out of the field. So that is one thing, a challenge here. Next. In terms of volume and complexity of data, so we are talking about uh, Internet of Things, big data, and others, where the trillion amount of data, the data is very, very vast. So where to go, how to call out, all this becomes a big problem now, because uh, you need to work on and get the work done, because you cannot go on, uh, do the work for a long time. So you need to look on the volume also. Next. So emerging technologies, uh, we can see some emerging technologies. Next. Next, please. Next, next. No, previous, previous. Previous, previous slide. Mm. So machine learning and artificial intelligence is emerging in a very, very big way. That will be compelled to connect with digital forensics. So you have to be having the knowledge. You have to have the knowledge of the artificial intelligence. I think most of you people are utilizing uh, chat GPT and others. But uh, now, those are all normal softwares. Of course, uh, there will be a lot of uh, softwares which is connecting with artificial intelligence in terms of digital forensic and machine learning. You should be also um, learning that. 
so it will in it will increase the speed but also the human error also will be reduced because artificial intelligence algorithms can work little bit better than the humans in some places next so the next one will be blockchain analysis or cryptocurrencies emerging and this will be also utilized by digital forensics next quantum computing the quantum computing uh, people might have aware of quantum physics that it gives a large volume so quantum computing also it will be very helpful uh, in uh, the digital forensics because of the kind of opportunity it is giving next so the legal and ethical consideration has to be taken i think the inaugural speaker uh, the inspector general of police also he also touched upon this area where you have a responsibility because when you are submitting the data to the uh, courts uh, so you should be authentic. If you are not authentic, what will happen is that somebody will be victimized who may be an innocent person and that uh, will be a uh, sin you have committed. So people are not thinking in that angle that uh, people will be uh, sent to gallows, sent to even uh, a death sentence will be there. So if you give a wrong data, if you manipulate data, that will be a big problem. Next. So the chain of custody should be maintained so that uh, I think you, you people are aware as a forensic scientist everything should be clear next so your digital evidence should be authenticated by proper people so that should be uh, expert or that should be a kind of a software or uh, people collated uh, a team can be even uh, giving that kind of authentication of the digital evidence next so Privacy is an important thing, but whether it is a fundamental right is a big issue. The Indian Constitution does not directly provide for privacy right, according to Article 21. So we have our right to privacy through uh, the right to life and liberty. But it is not directly told in 1950 when the Constitution was promulgated. Uh, but later you see that privacy now has come as an important thing because of the, uh, what you call, internet arrival. Next. So, IT company have some kind of uh, uh, thing they should uh, oblige with the government. So, if they are not obliging with the government, their license will be suspended also. So, they have to be very clear that uh, they have to disclose certain information when government is asking. At the same time, they cannot disclose their uh, private data to some other people. Next. So, you can see that according to section 72A of the Information Technology Act, any service provider that discloses personal information about a person without their consent or in violation of legally binding contract is subject for criminal prosecution. That means WhatsApp, Google or others, uh, which we have signed an agreement, they should not give our data. But still, a lot of people are selling our data that you can see that so that only we are getting calls from banks and other spam calls also. Next. So the future directions, how it's going to go? Next. Next slide, please. Sir. Next slide. So quantum uh, safe uh, cryptography will emerge as a big thing where the cryptography will be more stronger, more strengthened. Next. And increased collaboration with the private sector. Why increased collaboration with the private sector will happen is that because the basis of the cyberspace is standing on the private sector only. That's how Americans developed the internet and they give it to the private sector. So when it was between two uh, research organizations or the defense and then the professors, but later it went to the hands of the private sector. That's why Google was uh, invented in 1988, but you see that it came as a PhD project of two uh, research scholars in an university, Stanford University, and then it became a public venture. So that, that's why you can see that uh, you need to collaborate with many agencies uh, in the private sector. Next. And ethical considerations of artificial intelligence has to be followed upon because uh, artificial intelligence is like a thinking parrot. So that's the danger. In terms of parrot, when you feed a parrot to tell something in Telugu, it will speak back in Telugu. But artificial intelligence will not only speak Telugu, but it will speak Telugu better than you. That is the danger. Okay, so what you feed, you will get it back. So negative people feeding artificial intelligence will impact uh, the in output also. Next. So the final uh, recommendations would be like more training and more education. So Aditya institutions can take up more tasks in terms of uh, this particular uh, topic. They can invite people from law enforcement, private sector, uh, criminologists, forensic scientists, and make a group of people, collaborate with other people, and also update the legal framework. See, legal framework is also changing. The Information Technology Act came in 2000. 
and then later amended in 2008, is only a, speaking about e-commerce. It doesn't specifically speak about cybercrime except for six to seven law sections. But in future, new laws may come that is specific for cybercrimes. Next. Next. So, uh, previous, previous one. Collaboration between sectors has to happen. Uh, so, I told you, uh, cybercrime is a multidisciplinary field. It is not a single field. Same digital forensic is a multidisciplinary field between law, criminology, forensic science, and internet sciences. And uh, you have to invest more money in that. <coughs> cybercrime task forces, I think the inaugural speaker showed some of the task forces we are already having in India, CERT and others. But still more task forces can be created. And uh, cyber security awareness. So tomorrow, you people should go to uh, many places to create awareness among the public, among the students, among the faculty, and among others. Collaboration, international collaboration. Why should I have internet, uh, international collaboration? Is because cyber crime is an international crime, and the cyberspace is, even though it's an international space, is more an American space also. So we need to collate and uh, collaborate with people in US. And establish digital forensic labs. I think you have all lab facility in this college. So more facilities should be developed on this. And research should be enhanced. Now, it's not like about uh, research within the uh, laboratory, but research outside the laboratory also should happen. Because offenders are there moving online. So we need to connect with them. You need to connect with the victims. And uh, you, you are interested with certain responsibility. And interdisciplinary collaboration should be done. Forensic experts, criminologists, digital uh, experts, sociologists, all these people should come together. Privacy concerns already discussed earlier, and you have to uh, update the forensic policies also. So in terms of the conclusion, I would say that a new era is developing where the combination of uh, law, technology, and uh, the uh, social sciences is happening, where you are interested with the responsibility of integrate multiple knowledge. So it, you cannot stand with only one knowledge. And that's why you are going to address complex world of cybercrime and digital evidence. And as technology is evolving, challenges are going to evolve, that you are going to meet it. And uh, the future is to have some investigation in terms of emerging technologies. You have to collaborate with sectors and navigate le legal and ethical uh, complexities, which I discussed earlier. And also, the role of digital forensics only will become more crucial because of the fact that justice is the key thing. So in terms of uh, any crime victimization, the ultimate part is justice. So justice will not be handed to anybody just like that. So justice means it can be either in a form of punishment or in form of some other thing. But the justice rendered by the judiciary, uh, you as digital forensic scientist will have a great role to play. And with this, I thank the organizers once again and thank you.